Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. <laughs> And welcome everybody to another edition of our Minuteman University project. Uh, this is an effort to interview and talk with, give give the platform uh, to different people in the Second Amendment community, uh, Second Amendment advocates and authors, historians, researchers, activists, anything we can find out there to show how diverse our community is. And tonight we're talking with uh, Logan Matesh and uh, I'm gonna give him the floor. I model this uh, podcast after Three of my favorite podcasts out there, uh, the uh, Out of Order, James Kalita podcast, where he just uh, brings people on, gives them a half an hour to talk about their themselves and their projects. I think that's an awesome, simplistic way to run it. Uh, the, the Writing Shotgun with Charlie, uh, another great podcast where he uh, lets the people talk about their projects. And then, of course, uh, Gun Freedom Radio, uh, who have lots of people on. But my only complaint with all of those shows is they don't give people enough time. So we take an hour. Uh, we ask them for an hour, we bring them on for an hour, and we ask them three questions, what they're doing, then why they're doing it, and then how they're doing it. Our goal is to uh, let people know just who our Second Amendment heroes are out here, people that are doing the work that have accomplished so much, uh, and give you some insight that we're all human beings, and uh, why they're doing it, what drives everyone that keeps their motivation, and then how. It's because we're using uh, tools and uh, platforms that we all share, and uh, if uh, we can hope it, uh, shine light on some of the work that people are doing, we hopefully bring more people in. And uh, perhaps if you've got resources that can help them, uh, if you'd like to buy them a cup of coffee, consider that. Uh, the people that we talk to are not funded by angel investors, but we're not here to raise money. We're here to talk to Logan, uh, who is the, uh, uh, I guess, the proprietor of High Caliber History. Logan, tell us about you, what you do, how you do it, and why you do it. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Pete. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on here and, and share this platform with you and, uh, and and talk about a side of firearms that I think we don't always see a lot of or hear a lot of. Uh, and it's the history aspect of it. You know, you, you go to places like SHOT Show and, and NRA's annual meetings and stuff, and it's it's all about the new stuff and the, the best gear and what's the, the latest and greatest. And I think folks sometimes forget that all of what exists today is standing on the shoulders of firearms history and development that came before it. And so uh, I, I think it's important for us to remember where we came from, so to speak. You know, that that holds true uh, in, in all sorts of things in our culture. Uh, re remembering where you came from, uh, you know, from a familial standpoint, from a constitutional standpoint. Um, and, and from a firearms history standpoint. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be doing this kind of thing. Um, I'm, I'm blessed to do what I love and love what I do. Um, I've had some great experiences with some, some big institutions in the past, and I'm very fortunate to be able to go out on my own and do this um, so that I can really touch on exactly what interests me and what lights my fire. Um, and, and not have to worry about answering to anyone. Plus, uh, it's really nice not having to commute anymore. I was uh, doing doing about 100 miles uh, round trip uh, to the DC area working for the NRA Museum, and now I just walk from the bedroom to the dining room, so <laughs> it's a, a, a lot better. <laughs> and plus all the travel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it was a lot of travel. Last, uh, last May, I think I was home for nine days for out of the entire month so uh yeah it, it's nice not to be running around non-stop although on the flip side of that uh, the nra's annual meetings that just finished up this was the first time in five years that i wasn't there um so i felt like i needed a little bit of a breather though take a take a bit of a break and regroup and looking forward to going back in uh in nashville next year i love nashville it's a cool town so so for people that um aren't familiar uh, with your, uh, I guess, your uh, resume. Uh, you mentioned a bit that you'd worked at the NRA Museum. That's where I think we met in your role at the NRA Museum, uh -huh. both in DC, but also in uh, Tulsa. 
and maybe other places uh, as you, like I say, traveled as a, well, what was your role at the museum? So uh, officially, I was uh, the firearms specialist for the museum, which uh, I, I always joked, uh, basically a curator, but they didn't call me that so they could pay me less. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, obviously a day-to-day -day museum operations dealing with exhibit design and, and research and collections care. Um, but I was also the liaison for the almost 100 NRA affiliated gun collector clubs throughout the country. And that's a big deal. Um, they've had the gun collector clubs for decades and decades now, and, and they display at the annual meetings and compete for different uh, different awards and, and bragging rights and silver medals and stuff. Uh, and that has afforded me the opportunity to get in touch with some of the most amazing private collections that are in existence out there uh, and have access not only to the collections, but to the incredibly hospitable people uh, who own those collections. They've uh, you know, you know as well as I do, the gun community is is uh, like a big family, and and those collectors uh, have welcomed me with open arms uh, in many many ways. I feel like I have friends all throughout the country, um, and it's uh, it's a good feeling, and it's all tied together in that that common bond of firearms history. Um, you had mentioned give a little bit more of my background, so you know immediately my 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 immediate past job was with the National Firearms Museum. Uh, before that, I worked for the Smithsonian Institution. And before that, I worked for the National Park Service. Uh, and I have a degree in historic preservation. So um, this is all, I, I'm, I'm one of the few people, I, I would say, um, in my generation, our generation, that is actually fortunate enough to be able to have a job in the field in which I got my degree. Um, there's a lot of us, a lot of people out there who spent tons of money going to college and they're, they're working in a field completely unrelated. So very fortunate to, to not have that be my situation. So That's very cool. And I, I, I guess I had known, but I never asked you about the Smithsonian. Were you working at the firearms at the Smithsonian? No, I wasn't. Um, it was interesting. I worked for the, the new museum there, uh, the African American History and Culture Museum, before it was a thing. Uh, I literally worked there before they had broken ground. Um, and so it was interesting to get involved on a ground level from a collections management standpoint with that. Uh, and actually be helping develop some of the policies and procedures that go into helping run a museum behind the scenes and figuring out uh, different uh, different ways of displaying items. Uh, and on, on occasion, they would have firearm things pop up and uh, and they knew I was kind of the gun guy on staff. And, and so we would put our heads together and try to figure things out. And if we couldn't come to a, a consensus, we'd head over to the American History Museum with the National Firearms Collection and their uh, their curator, Dave Miller. And we'd all put our heads together and, and try to figure out what was going on. So uh, I, I left before the museum opened. Um, I've, I've been once to, to check it out and, and see how things came to fruition. Um, and it's neat. They've got a, a number of firearms on display, stuff mostly that is on loan from the American History Museum collection. Um, and it's pretty cool because a lot of what they've got on display are things uh, that, that you, you simply wouldn't see uh, on display at the American History Museum. So it's, it's neat to be able to, to branch that out and see some of that stuff that otherwise uh, might go unnoticed. It's interesting. I'm curious, is that, re I mean, I'm sure the Smithsonian's archives are massive. Is that real allocating stuff from the Smithsonian archives to be displayed in that building? Or is it like re or obtaining and acquiring historic items? So it was, it's both. Um, we started with a collection of zero. Uh, and while I was there, you know, they were collecting fast and furious, trying to get everything squared away. Uh, and I think the collection now is about 37,000 pieces, um, which is decent. It's, it's small by a Smithsonian standpoint, but, um, 
but they have supplemented with with a lot of really interesting loans, um, uh, inter inter institutional loans. So um, all the firearms that they've got there. Well, I shouldn't say all because I haven't been back in more than a year, but vast majority of the firearms that they have on display are stuff that belongs to the American History Museum's collection that uh, that they've got on loan to help tell that story. Very cool. As you described your um, experience and then your transition and what you're doing now, it sounds a lot like when you hear about some of the high-end military operators and stuff that, you know, get trained up and do things uh, for Uncle Sam. And then once they retire, they come out and uh, disseminate, you know, the knowledge information that they've acquired as instructors and mm -hmm. uh, get to actually focus on the things that they found most important or the skill sets that they have uh, to share. And it sounds like you're in a similar situation where you've had the experience of you know doing the real thing. And then of course, all the networking and like you say, opportunities you've got to meet the people uh, that make all that, all those engines work. And uh, now you're free. Now you've got those, that those, all those skill sets and you've got the, the freedom to do it as an individual, to, to pursue things as an individual now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the I think the, the most uh, timely example of that is uh, back in March. Uh, I live in Virginia, and so back in March, the Virginia Association of Museums, which represents museum professionals all throughout the state, they were having their annual conference, uh, and it was their 50th anniversary, and I submitted a proposal to go and talk about uh, firearms, how to deal with firearms in museum collections. Uh, which is a big deal because generally speaking, the museum field as a whole um, is quite liberal. Uh, and so this was an issue that they had never discussed in their, uh, in their annual meetings, despite having plenty of museums that have firearms in their collections, uh, you know, especially being in Virginia, you know, given, given all of the Civil War and Revolutionary War history here, um, and so uh, they, the committee had some misgivings. They weren't entirely sure uh, if they wanted to do it, um, but it, it made it through the committee. Um, and I gave the presentation there. Uh, it was packed. It ended up being standing room only. Um, and it was very well received. And there were no political baiters trying to, you know, sway me into, into giving them sound bites. You know, it was nothing like that. It was, it was uh, a room full of individuals who were genuinely curious about how to best care for and display and, uh, and manage legally uh, the firearms that they have in their collections. And so it was, it was an honor to be the first person in 50 years to be able to give that presentation. Um, and I've received good feedback from that. And uh, it's been, been a lot of fun um, hearing from folks uh, that were there in that session and knowing that things were, uh, were well received. And if you weren't there, then they guess would have to depend on maybe researching via the internet forums or? Yeah, you know, and unfortunately there's not a whole lot of stuff out there on internet forums about uh, firearm collections care. Um, so their the first default is to put it in the basement. Yeah, exactly, you know, or, or to try to care for it like you would, uh, a piece of furniture, uh, you know, because of the wood or, or uh, uh, an iron artifact because of the metal on the barrel. And, you know, and that's, that's all fine and dandy. You know, you can do that in a pinch if you have to, but that's, that's certainly not the ideal way to treat them. So um, it's, it was nice to be able to, to be able to get down into the actual specifics of firearms care and display uh, in museums. So. I mean, I, I don't want to, I want to take time to talk about your projects, but uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, person, uh, avenue to take because we had a chat with the, I guess the curator of the uh, J.M. Davis Museum. And mm -hmm. as you walk around and we had a bunch of people from Gun Channels there asking some different questions. And as he was answering the questions, it came up about the uh, the licensing for some of the NFA stuff and the crazy stuff. Yeah. Crime guns and stuff there, 
And I never really had thought about uh, the museums having to deal with the legal side of the ATF and everything um, without getting too much into that, just, just a curiosity. And I'll start asking some questions from the audience here. Um, does the ATF like really harass museums or do they kind of leave museums alone or is there a, is there a, <sighs> you know, that's a short answer. Yes. With an if long answer, no, with a, but, okay. um, <laughs> uh, it be to be a, a standard or anything. Yeah, no, what it comes down to is, is, uh, museums have to abide by any standard federal law, you know, so, uh, that's going to involve having to deal with FFLs. If you want modern firearms, it's um, going to severely restrict the ability to have anything that's class three. Um, but then government run museums, whether that's state, federal or local, they can kind of write their own rules. And that's, that's a little different. It changes things. Um, it would be a whole, it would be a whole lot easier if there was simply just a museum firearms license that would blanket cover everything. Um, and that is, that is the one thing that, that England does better in terms of gun laws than we do here is that they actually have a museum firearms license that removes a lot of the incredibly awkward red tape that we have here in this country. Well, that's, you see, again, this would be an interesting topic just to have you on and chat about this. Um, yeah, I never thought about any of that, but um, it sounds like from my understanding and from what I've got, my understanding of it is limited. Uh, that the museums kind of fall in the clauses of the laws that say uh, kind of like except for military and law enforcement and somehow government owned museums have to call, fall into that gray area, I think. Yeah, it's it, it is it gets real convoluted real quick, you know. Uh, and, and like you said, yeah, we could we could spend uh, an entire conversation just going over the, the legalities of being able to display things in museums uh, and, and how uh, the way federal law is written that actually prevents a lot of museums from being able to display certain items um, and has often led to their destruction simply to prevent the owners from being what I call unconvicted felons. <laughs> and that's sad. Uh, we talked a little bit before the show about having uh, a chat in the future where we talk about firearms museums. Maybe we can talk about some of those subjects on that chat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't know what you've got planned next, but I know that uh, Sam of Anarchy 92 here had, had put up a question a little bit ago. Do we do we want to address that or do you have something else you wanted to jump into? Or No, nope, you read my mind. I was just about to ask that one. So let's hit that one. <laughs> yeah. So again, Sam of Anarchy 92 says, what's your favorite handgun throughout history? Um, and Sam spells favorite wrong. He spells it with a U. So uh, are you are you British, Sam? Uh, maybe. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, that's a tough one. Favorite handgun throughout history. That's like asking someone if they have a favorite kid. Um, uh, that's really, really tough. Um, I really like the Colt Walker revolvers. Um, because they really, you know, they helped Sam Colt get back on the map. Um, he had created his Patterson revolvers uh, a decade or so before, and the, you know, the business ended up going bust. And uh, it was it was Captain Walker of the the Texas Rangers. No, no pun intended there, but with Walker, Texas Ranger, but, but it was Captain Sam Walker who decided, you know, to get a hold of Sam Colt and say, hey, you know can you beef up your Patterson and make me a gun? And uh, Colt at that time was flat broke, didn't have the ability to create these guns, but uh, he was a master of uh, sales uh, of sales and deception for the, for the lack of a better term. Um, and he was like, yeah, sure, I can do it. I can build you a thousand of them. And he ended up going with, with Eli Whitney and, and that family to help get the money and the machinery together to build the guns because he straight up was not in a, a situation either financially or mechanically to build those guns. Uh, and the walkers were a hit. Um, they had their flaws, but, but they were a hit and they enabled him to have the capital to go and create his 1851 Navy, um, which then opens up the door for him. And it, it really just sets the floodgates open 
for Colt as a business. Uh, you know, un unfortunately, he he dies uh, an untimely death in 1862 and doesn't really see his company grow. Uh, you know, he doesn't see even the introduction of the iconic Peacemaker, which doesn't come along till 1873. But so I guess the the long and short of it, my favorite handgun throughout history, I, I would have to say I really do like the Colt Walkers um, because without the Walkers, uh, Sam Colt never would have been able to get his business up and running again. And had he not been able to do that, who knows what that story could have been uh, in terms of firearms history and American history, because the, the single action army plays a huge role uh, in, in American history and American culture. Um, and, and the walkers themselves are incredibly rare. There's uh, less than less than 100 of them left in existence. And, you know, they, they sell for downright stupid money. You know, we're talking six and seven figures and, and I've had the opportunity to, to handle a, a handful of them and they're just really, really cool guns. So really cool guns. Nope, oh, are you still there? I think I think I think we might have lost Pete for a minute. Yep, I could then my computer froze up there, but I think I'm back. <laughs> okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay, so then uh thanks for answering that one. Now I was gonna cheat and ask I'm just trying to answer that question myself, and I'm gonna pick the Browning uh pocket browning, twenty five ACP. Mm, uh, mm -hmm. so just a more curious your insight on that one. You know, that's that's a really cool little gun. Uh, Browning obviously is is uh, the granddaddy and, and godfather of all modern firearms, um, and and his design with that goes on to to influence a lot of other firearms designs that we see throughout the 20th century. Whether it's uh, people doing similar aesthetic designs on the guns, doing similar uh, lockup mechanisms on the guns. Um, it, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that that we owe to Browning, and it, it kind of starts with some of it with that design in terms of the handgun stuff. You know, I'd mentioned wow. at the beginning, you know, everything is is standing on the shoulders of what came before, uh, and that is certainly an instance of a, a handgun that that provided a foundation for a lot of stuff to stand on even today. I think we could probably dig into either Colt or Browning, I, obviously, for forever. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Dig into some questions from the Gun Channel side. I should mention Gun Channels is a community we built. It's going on in six years now. It's a place for conversations like this. Uh, David on the Gun Channel side is asking, do you live in D.C., Maryland, or Virginia? I live in Virginia. Uh, I live in the Shenandoah Valley um, near Winchester, Virginia, which is the very northern end of the, the valley. Um, I can damn near spit and hit West Virginia. So um, it, it's beautiful out this way, but it made for a hellish commute uh, working for the NRA. But love it out this way. Definitely, definitely don't live in the district and don't live in Maryland. Uh, I, I certainly couldn't have the impressive safe collection that I have. Uh, if, if I live there, so. And is this close to Monticello then? Uh, no, Monticello is uh, a few hours south of me down in the valley. Um, oh. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful area there down near Charlottesville. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a couple hours to get there, so. And uh, I'll give you off air, but David's offering some assistance if you never need any help. Uh, then we <laughs> okay. Uh, another question from David, does Logan come across Pro 2A non-gun owners, maybe people that are just into the history or the human rights involved? You know, that's that's a good question. Uh, I can kind of flip it in a different direction. I don't know that I have specifically come across any Pro Second Amendment non-gun owners, um, but I have, and I, I swear it relates somehow, I have... Uh, museum professional colleagues that work with firearms, but are liberal, which is kind of an interesting way to spin it. Um, because as I'd mentioned, the museum field as a whole is generally quite liberal and relatively anti-gun. Um, but, uh, but I know some folks that 
are liberal and pro-gun and and work in museums and try to help uh, further the education of individuals about our history and, and through our firearms history. So I don't know if that totally answers the question. I might've gone off in a, a weird direction. If not, let me know and I'd be happy to try to readdress it. <laughs> That's perfect. That's actually what the good question does, right? Is gives you some open uh, room to move. One of the things I had left notes before is that one of the things I find most interesting about firearms in our country is that they're so inter interweaved or woven uh, into everything, our technology, our our, our verbiage, our uh, our self, in, you know, our, our self uh, uh, resilience, uh, mm -hmm. our independence. But uh, again, our, our tech and our innovation make so much of it comes straight from from firearms, and and they're involved in uh, so many small and then large things. As historians, I would assume that they have to at least acknowledge, even if they're frustrated that they have to bring guns into. It. I mean. Don't, it would, you know, there's things that must become a dilemma for them to, because you know, they are so important, so such a significant part of our culture. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It's it it can be difficult to try to to separate the two in in this country specifically because it is so intertwined, um, and it and because of that and because of the leanings of a lot of museums, I think it's a, an area that really doesn't get the, the due that it could and should to help, uh, help tell the story uh, of American history in, in any way that they're trying to tell it in that particular exhibit. Um, and it certainly, I think, could be enriched if they were willing to branch out uh, and allow some firearms interpretation but alas, that, that generally doesn't happen, so. Again, without getting too much into the museum side then, um, another question from David is on the gun channel side, is there a gun or ammo out now, modern, that you think will become a historic piece? Is there a t or is there a type of iconic, iconic firearm or ammo, wait, or is, or, is that, or is that iconic firearm and ammo a thing of the past? Oh, that's a good question. Um, modern stuff that'll become a historic piece. I guess so. Does that mean like something that we're that we're using now that we won't that'll end up obsolete? Um, that, that's how I'm gonna take that. Maybe uh, maybe if if David thinks I'm I'm going off in the wrong direction, he can he can let us know. But so is there something? Is there ammo out now that I think will become historic? That's a hard one. Um, are there guns out now that I think will end up historic? Um, it's hard to say with modern production stuff, um, but I can say like certain pieces that are fairly recent production, um, but are no longer produced that have become historic. Uh, and, and a good example of that would be the, the Mateba auto revolver, um, which took a lot of its design cues from the Webley Fosbury uh, from decades before, uh, where the frame is two pieces and it actually cycles uh, like a semi automatic in a sense. Uh, and that cycling back and forth is what turns the cylinder uh, to bring the next round uh, in line to be fired. Um, so I, I think that's something that's fairly uh, a modern piece that is kind of turning into something that's historic. Uh, the prices uh, are, are going up on those. Um, and then uh, just as, as I was talking about that, I was thinking there's another thing, uh, another gun that'll probably end up historic uh, in its own right, simply from a production numbers standpoint of things. You know, things tend to tend to end up rare when they're produced in low numbers. Uh, and the, the first thing that comes to my mind with that is uh, Hudson Manufacturing. They, they came out with that interesting uh, looking 1911 uh, design that they had come up with. Um, and unfortunately, things did not go well for them and they went belly up, um, left a, a sour taste in the mouth of a lot of people. Um, but those are interesting guns. They were uh, a, a interesting twist, both visually and mechanically on the 1911 design that unfortunately just didn't pan out. Um, and I think that's how we end up with a lot of guns that end up being viewed as historic. 
Um, uh, you know, they were designs that people tried and didn't quite go well, and it goes to the wayside. So maybe someday we'll see uh, Hudson pistols fetching a premium. I don't know. I mean, definitely on the short side, they kind of did, but like you say, it'll kind of be up to history to determine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that can be tough to say, you know. Now, this one might not be, might be tough or it might not be for you, but gun owning, gun loving Grandpa Stanley on the Gun Channel side is asking, what's the highest price gun that you have handled? Oh, that's an easy one. Okay. <laughs> that's an easy one. So, a uh, little bit of background. Um, there are, the Parker Shotgun Company up in Meridian, Connecticut, uh, in the 1920s, they were celebrating a milestone, their 200,000th gun. And so they wanted to pull out all the stops and, and create something really, really spectacular. You know, the, the deepest bluing, the finest engraving, the best checkering, the highest quality wood. Uh, and, and it was a gun that they called their invincible grade. And at a time when you can buy a new Ford for like 450 bucks, those shotguns were $1,250 a piece. Uh, and so they were exceptionally expensive and they were custom order only guns. They were in their catalog uh, until 1929. Of course, the stock market crashes in October of that year. And then anyone who was able to afford one of those guns has just jumped out of a New York high rise. So uh, so in, in the seven years that they offered those guns, they only made three of them. They are exceptionally rare. Uh, you know, generally, uh, it, it's cool if you can say, well, this gun is a one of a kind. It's a one of a kind. Well, these, it's three of a kind and that's, and that's pretty damn cool. Um, and publishing magnet, Robert Peterson spent his lifetime putting together, uh, one of the finest firearm collections in the country. And he made it his life's work to track down the individual owners of those three Parker Invincible shotguns and convince them to sell. Um, money was no object for Bob since he was a billionaire and he was able to get those guns and, and reunite them together. Uh, and they've got an insurance value on them somewhere around like 1.4 million each. Um, and, and that's, probably low. I mean, those guns easily, you know, that's an older estimate for that insurance value. They're probably at least easily $2 million guns uh, or more in their own right. So those are, are definitely by far uh, the most expensive guns that I have ever handled. Very cool. And I happen to have seen those, I guess a lot of people have. They're the one of the first things you see when you enter the National Firearms Museum, the NRA's museum. Uh, just yep. outside of Washington, D.C. In fact, you gave us pretty much that uh, description a little bit more on the tour that you gave us in the last couple of years ago when I was there. Yep. And I think one of the neatest things about that story, well, there's a couple of things that are neat about that story, but first, the, the accumulation of money that allowed them to be reunited was done by somebody who was making gun magazines, outdoor mm -hmm. magazines. So gun publishing, uh, the 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 you know the first amendment the second amendment coming together uh and yep. capitalism allowed this guy to amass enough money and then he had an interest and an intent as a capitalist and an individual private entity to accumulate what he found interesting which was firearms and yeah the, i think that like you say they might have an individual value but the value of the three of them together like that and the story that they represent again that's got to be a, a, a difficult yeah. thing to put a price on yeah, absolutely. You know, and that and that's one of those things, you know, really the only the only sales examples that you have, of course, are the original sale prices uh, from the 1920s. And then you have what Bob paid for them. Um, but then, of course, they become worth exponentially more now that they are all three reunited. So um, it's, it's one of those things, as with a lot of stuff that's in museums, firearms or otherwise, it can be very difficult to try to uh, to put a financial number on there because it's it's just not easy to do because this stuff generally doesn't come up for sale. So and as more money exists and people become richer, the the resources of people to acquire these things becomes greater. That makes their prices potentially higher and higher all the time. Exactly. Yep. Sky's the limit. You know, um, this is uh, this is kind of a golden age for firearms collecting in terms of prices. And I attribute a lot of that um, to the fact that the boomer generation has retired uh, and they've done well for themselves financially. 
Uh, and so now they have that disposable income to spend on the things that they wanted when they were kids, you know. Uh, and that they, they value, they still value that, the, the right. Sex, what it represents in these pieces of history in our cult, in our American history. Mm -hmm, exactly. And so uh, that's, I think, has really helped drive the price up for a lot of collectible firearms today because there is an entire generation's worth of disposable income uh, out there and able to purchase those pieces. And the uh, auction houses are you know, using the cutting edge of technology to, to bring just amazing resources to people that are not just purchasing these things, but just people that are interested. Some of the best photographs and the most insightful history is due to the exchange of these pieces of property between people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to, to speak specifically to that, I'm, uh, I'm uh, delighted to be part of that because one of my clients is Rock Island Auction Company. Um, and so I have, I have spent some time with them over the last six months or so uh, writing guest blog posts for them uh, on their website for certain interesting firearms uh, that are, are coming up in their different premier auctions. And, uh, and so that's afforded me the ability to, to go through their auction listings and be like, I, I think this is really cool. And, you know, and they do great video on, on stuff that they think is really neat. Um, but it, it's cool to be able to, to pull stuff that, um, you know, that either they aren't doing in house or Ian McCollum from forgotten weapons isn't doing, uh, you know, it's stuff that I can, pick out and go down a different road uh, and write about those pieces. So we're, we're able to give a, a, a broader bit of coverage to a wider swath of firearms uh, that are uh, important in history. Cause you know, different, you know, different strokes for different folks and you know, what, what interests Ian doesn't necessarily interest, you, you know, Joe Blow down the street. So um, we can kind of cover a little bit of everything that way. It's awesome. And that's collaboration and network and, you know, working together at its finest. I want to take a second and give credit where credit's due. Two amazing uh, resources we have out there. It's first the um, Rock Island Auction House, which I had a chance to visit and they gave me a tour and it's Im impressive isn't even the word. And again, what it represents is the, uh, the free exchange of property, his, you know, pieces of history. And, yeah. uh, and then the, the, the ways that they could handle this and they've chosen to handle it by making it available to you and others to, to lend your insight. Not only does it make the pieces more valuable, it makes it more interesting as consumers and capitalists, and we can all relish in that. It's all positive. I also want to give credit to the NRA. This is an NRA commercial or anything, but again, some of the most valuable firearms on the planet are free. Uh, you, can, you can go up and look at them. There's magnifying glasses, so you can inspect them. They're arranged yeah. in a way that, that explains the history and the progression free and pretty much every day of the year you can go there if you're ever in dc sneak away it's just a quick ride from downtown or from all the sites downtown and yep. uh you park in their parking lot it's an air-conditioned building if you ask them ahead of time you get somebody like logan or whoever's there now to uh to give you a tour i mean it is certainly a resource and one of the things that was on un, uh, notice sometimes uh, when you hear all the nra stuff yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, do we? Can we answer another question from uh, from the comments? You bet. Let's. We're here for it. Let's do it. Okay. So the one I'm looking at here, uh, Tim Eighteen Wheels asks: Were there any attempts by the CSA, the Confederate States of America, to duplicate the Remington 1858? So the new model army, um, not specifically. Uh, they didn't try to duplicate uh, the the Remington but they did try to duplicate something similar to that. Now, of course, uh, the, the most visually distinct difference between a Colt 51 Navy or a Colt 60 Army and the Remington 1858 New Model Army is the fact that the Remington has a top strap, um, which makes it a, a little more sturdy uh, of a firearm. And uh, the Confederacy didn't ever try to outright copy the Remington, uh, but they did try to copy the Whitney revolver. Uh, and the Whitney was also a solid framed revolver. It had a top strap uh, on it as well. Uh, and they were made by a firm uh, known as Spiller and Burr. Mr. Spiller and, and Mr. Burr um, had a factory in Atlanta uh, 
uh, set up to create uh, their particular Confederate revolvers. Uh, there, there was really no main Confederate arsenal uh, putting forth a concerted effort to create standardized arms in a consolidated nature. Um, there, there was the the Virginia Manufactory in Richmond, but it was very different. So, but in terms of handguns, can uh, I interrupt all, to ask a yeah, yeah. question there? Is that because they couldn't? They didn't have the resources, or because there was enough firearms that they just didn't need it, they could acquire them other ways? Uh, well, a little bit of both. They didn't have the resources. They certainly didn't have uh, the factories and the capitals uh, and the capital necessary uh, to have big manufacturing places. They were importing a lot of stuff from England. Um, in fact, I've, I've written an entire research paper that's been published, and then I turned it into a, a live lecture presentation about a man named James Henry Burton, um, who was uh, in charge of all Confederate armories at one point. Um, he'd worked for Harper's Ferry Arsenal beforehand. He worked for the, the Royal Small Arms Factory over in Enfield in England um, and, and was instrumental in helping create the pattern 1853 Enfield rifle that got imported and used in tremendous numbers by the Confederacy. Um, some of the Confederate uh, tooling that, uh, that they were making arms on was stuff that Burton managed to pillage from the Harper's Ferry arsenal after the Confederates burned it shortly after uh, secession began, shortly after Virginia seceded from the Union. So, um, so yeah, they, they just didn't have the resources to put together a big consolidated national armory like the United States had up at Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. Um, so they relied much more heavily on imported arms and on private contracts uh, to put the stuff together uh, and and build things, so um, very very different than how things were handled up north. Good question, and thanks for the answer. Um, one of the reasons I uh, do this show is to inspire people and to give people some insight into the people that are out there doing things for the second. Um, so I think a question here for, again from David on the Gun Channel side can get us into the the why question. I'll give you as much time as you'd like to. Talk about why you do what you do. I know you've talked about uh, others that you in the uh, museum field might not necessarily be pro guns. So it can't be the most welcoming environment. So there must be some amount of determination required. Uh, but his question is, what sparked your interest in firearms? And I'll, I'll give a second to stew on that while I ask a personal question here. I hear a puppy in the background. Is that yours? Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, they've. Uh... Worry, well, just curious what kind of puppy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two. I've got uh, my wife and I. We have two King Charles Cavalier little spaniels. They were they were both rescues, and uh, Mama's still at work, and I've got them locked out of the office here. So they're they're barking. I apologize to anyone oh, if, don't, if don't you're picking that up. Don't apologize. No, right? we're, so. we're pro dog here, so it would be be weird to not have some dog noises. So I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. My gotcha. uh, mom had a dog like that, so I'm familiar with them. Anyway, so thanks okay. for the uh, little aside there. Uh, what yeah. got you into firearms and why do you do what you do? So what got me into firearms? Uh, I owe it all to my grandfather. Uh, he's German, so I call him Opa, which is German for grandfather. So I owe everything to my Opa. Um, when I was 10 years old, that's when I got my first firearm. He bought me a, a Marlin Model 15YN, which is colloquially known as their Lil Buckaroo. Uh, it's a single shot bolt action 22 rifle. Um, my mother is fairly anti-gun, uh, so it took a lot of cajoling to convince her uh, to be able to, to buy that gun for me for my 10th birthday. Uh, and the concession that ended up being made for that uh, was that the gun was kept at Opa's house in the safe and the bolt was kept separately at mom's house, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny looking back on it. But, uh, but that's the gun that I learned how to shoot on. Um, Opa did three gun action shooting and I would go to the range with him. He was a welder by trade. He made me my own reactive steel target and I would wait for all the guys to, to finish shooting and then we'd set up the target and bring out a, a brick of 22 and just, uh, shoot till, till heart's content. Um, no, come on girls, stop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, no, so would, would, dogs are would, no problem at all would shoot till to heart's content. Um, and so that was really where it started. 
Um, and then I uh, got into high school and started doing some shotgunning, uh, doing skeet and trap, uh, also with, uh, with OPA. And that was a lot of fun. And then I went off to college and, and things went in a, a slightly different turn. And, and I started uh, doing preservation related things, um, but was still very involved in, in the, the Second Amendment community. Um, because I was a freshman in college, uh, you know, just a couple hundred miles away from Virginia Tech when the massacre happened there in 2007. Um, so that got me involved in an organization that I don't even know if it still exists anymore. It was called Students for Concealed Carry on Campus. Um, and, and I was uh, a liaison for them briefly. I was also the president of the Firearms Club at my university. I held the distinction of being the oldest club on campus, uh, coincidentally founded in 1911, uh, which is a good year to found a gun club. Um, but unfortunately, because of uh, events like Virginia Tech in 2007, it's what led to the school pulling the funding from the club, uh, and it actually dissolved when I was a junior. Um, but I'm proud to say that they actually restarted the club in 2017. Uh, it's up and running again. Um, and I've been fortunate enough, they've had me back twice now uh, as a guest speaker to, to talk about firearms history and technology and how it relates to, to preservation of things. Um, so that's that's kind of how I got into it was was with my grandfather uh, uh, when I was a little kid and then uh, through through everything that I've done uh, in college with my degrees that's when I was really able to figure out how to to put the two passions together and miracle of miracles managed to get paid for it too awesome um, I think uh, it's interesting to hear that because not everyone, gets into firearms or awareness in the same way. So uh, I was gonna, I think of all the different ways. That's a fun way, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. And then the uh, original compromise, I had to deal with the same. My parents were divorced, and one half of the family was definitely not into guns. The other side was it was just a thing like a shovel or a rake. And uh, yeah, the original compromises, right, in order to get your, your first guns, your first BB guns. And to, yep, you know, exactly. All right, so, Question again from David is, what kind of team do you have to do the research or do you do everything alone? Uh, it's a three person team, uh, me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's me and uh, a couple of incredibly heavy shelf sagging bookshelves uh, in, in the dining room turned, off, uh, turned home office. Um, and, and so I, I do all the research myself. Of course, I, I lean heavily on folks that I know in the industry when I have questions that, that I simply can't answer. Um, but no, the, the long and short of it is, is that I am a, a one-man production. And are you, is that a frustration or is that a, a relief? Because I'm guessing it could go either way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think it depends on the day. Um, it's, it's oh, yeah. a relief in that, um, you know, I research what I want when I want to do it. Um, at the same time, my only coworkers are two dogs that don't talk. So, uh, you know, it, it can get a little lonely working from home at times, but, um, but generally speaking, I, I, I see it as a plus because I, I get to do, um, my work on my terms. Um, and anytime you're able to, to be able to do what you're passionate about and do it on your own terms, I, I think that's uh, well, that's almost the essence of the American dream, right? Sure is. And that's what we're here to uh, let people you know know that there's all kinds of potentials and that there's no recipes necessarily. You get to write your own. Yep, exactly. And it's uh, it's been a very freeing process here over the past uh, seven months or so. Now, I've had a chance to ask you a bunch of questions, but I haven't asked you this one before, and David asked again on the Gun Channel side a good one. Uh, do you get to tour the factories or interview any big players in the industry? Yes, uh, I've, I've done both. Um, the, the coolest factory tour uh, a couple years ago, I went up to, to Colt uh, and toured the floor there, um, got to see all of the processes going on there. Um, 
they were tooling up to create um, the the Night Cobra, um, which was the, the all black finish Cobra. Um, we were under an NDA there because we saw the those guns getting put together and they weren't public knowledge yet. We got to see them doing the traditional bone and charcoal case hardening on some single action army frames. Um, I saw, you know, crates and crates full of, of 1911 forgings that were yet to be turned into guns. Um, and I saw pallets upon pallets upon pallets of 249 saws that were getting ready to make their way to our boys overseas to, to spread some freedom seeds. Um, and it was, it was really cool seeing all of that stuff on the production side of it. Uh, but then I also got to sit down with their company historian, Beverly Haynes, uh, and she pulled out some of the old factory records and, and got to look through stuff, which was really, really cool. Um, they pulled out, or she pulled out uh, stuff from their Civil War records. So I, I pulled up records from when, uh, from the day Sam Colt died, uh, January 10th, uh, 1862, and got to see, you know, what exactly they shipped out of the factory that day. Um, saw some of their World War II uh, 1911 shipment records, um, which it, it's just massive. Um, saw their uh, uh, the uh, the first book of stuff that they had when they were sending out the very first pythons, um, and and uh, it was it was really really cool to go through the factory there uh, and get to to delve into their records and check that stuff out. It was uh, it was a lot of fun to see that stuff. And I'm going to see if I can figure out how to do this screen share thing. Uh, over on the left, there'll be the toolbar that'll pop up when you hover over it. And then there's the green ones, the second one down. And then it'll ask you, what do you want to share? OK, let me see here. Share the screen. Did Because uh, I can't see it. Does, uh, is there a picture yeah. showing up now? Yep, working fine. OK, so uh, the image here that uh, that I've got up on here uh, is the the Colt Python record book. And those records over on the left hand side, that's from the very first shipments of serial number one and serial number two and serial number three and and so on and so forth. And so it was it was really neat to go through and, and get hands on and, and check out those records. So I'm just curious, does serial numbers one and, you know, some low numbers, do those go somewhere specific or do those just literally go out to, to somebody randomly? And... Uh, it was weird. Uh, serial number one is still retained by the factory. Um, two, three, and five went out to certain individuals. Four was kept back. Uh, they shipped some stuff out of order. Um, it was uh, it was kind of an unusual way of doing things. They they even though they were making them sequentially, they they weren't necessarily shipping them sequentially. Uh, so it was a little different in that regard. Um, That's got to be typical, I would think. Though, don't companies normally keep their serial no both serial numbers for specific things, like you say, their own collections and things? Yeah, a lot of times that's that's how it goes. They do keep their own stuff. Um, another thing I'll share here because I, I don't think everyone always realizes it, but again, that's that's my ugly mug, and that's the the blue onion dome on the Colt factory there, um, and that's not where Colt manufactures anymore. That's you know that's the iconic building, but <clears throat> excuse me, that's the okay. iconic building, but. They have long since moved out of there into a more modernized factory. But that is the uh, old factory where like the 1911s were made? That is the old factory. Yeah. I mean, that was the one that Sam Colt himself uh, initially built uh, and got uh, up and running. Uh, and they were there um, through the, I think, uh, mid 90s or something like that before they moved away to a different location. Um, but yeah, the, the majority of all the incredibly historic guns to come out of Colt were made in that factory. Now, when you were looking at those records, that made me think of, I'd watched a show about how Google had gone around and digitally, you know, scanned all these documents and stuff. Has, have the um, manufacturers, are you aware, do they, or the, I guess the museums probably digitally scan everything, but have the 
companies, the manufacturers themselves in their history departments digitally scan things? No. Um, generally speaking, the firearm companies are not focusing on their history. You know, they're focusing on getting new guns developed and out the door, uh, and they're kind of leaving their past in the past. Uh, of course, I'd mentioned Colt has a, an in-house historian. They've got two of them, uh, and Smith & Wesson did for a long time as well. Uh, it was a gentleman by the name of Roy Jinks, um, and a couple years ago, uh, Roy held that job, I think, for between 40 and 50 years. I mean, he he is Smith & Wesson history. Um, a couple of years ago, they reorganized how they were doing things, and they they advertised Roy's job and were going to make him reapply for the job that he'd held for half a century. Wow. Um, and he's like, nope, forget it. I'm out. And he retired. Um, and he personally owns a lot of the records because decades ago, uh, Smith and Wesson was cleaning house and they were throwing them in the dumpster, literally throwing it away. And he went in and, and rescued uh, the factory records and, and stuff. So, it's kind of short-sighted of them to have done that, but you know, that's uh, that's the way things go when when you're owned by a larger umbrella organization, and the focus is on getting guns out the door, not necessarily looking back at where you came from. So, exactly like when you, when a company changes hands, it's the new if the new company doesn't value the history, then yeah, they're gonna disregard it. That's interesting too. I've done some research into the Bannerman Castle and the Bannerman catalog and all, you know the whole thing there. And mm -hmm. same kind of thing as they downscaled or just kind of fell apart as the family didn't want it anymore. Uh, yep. it, 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 a bunch of their records and can you imagine like all of their records were just dumped and there was people that were aware of it at the time and grabbed them. And a, yeah, you know, and a neat thing that you know we live in a free country. And we live in a place where, unfortunately, companies do do what we just talked about. But because we're in a free country where people are interested and willing and able and have collected the, some of that stuff or been able to be in the right place at the right time, uh, we have private collections that mm -hmm. keep history alive. And, you know, that's that's part of it. It would be great if the companies all you know realized the, the value of keeping their own history and whatnot. But, yeah, I mean, obviously there's uh, collectors that... Uh, are doing that for them. And that's part of the free market and part of what makes this also interesting. Exactly, yep. It's, uh, the, the industry wouldn't be nearly what it is today without the collectors because the individual collectors are the ones who, who take the time to really delve into the research and get into the weeds and fall down the rabbit hole and realize they fell down the rabbit hole but still continue digging further into the hole. Um, and and it's that's where all the the knowledge is coming from. You know, the the companies themselves aren't the ones that are putting out the books on the history of the arms. It's it's different researchers and collectors doing that. And we we owe a debt of gratitude for them spending you know literally a lifetime, many of them uh, gathering the knowledge and putting it all together, uh, and then sending it to print so that we can have access to it. Especially and accumulated, it's going to be just probably, I'm not even exaggerating, thousands of years with the man hours. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. And that's, again, something that um, we try to, you know, these shows are an attempt to encourage and inspire people to, to be part of this whole thing, to value your voice. The people that have done the amazing things that we stand on the shoulders of today are just individuals who either got frustrated or wanted to add their, uh, their, their voice to the conversation. Uh, so just in what we talked about here, the collectors, the people that are gathering this information, many of them are old, older and maybe not familiar with the new technology. If they're literally spending their time researching and, and gathering the data and acquiring the collections, uh, there might be opportunities for people that are interested in the uh, creation of content to hook up with these people that have st valuable stuff to talk about and uh, work with or collaborate with them. Uh, and then just doing the research, I can't tell you how much satisfaction I've had a couple of times researching things like the Ring of Fire guns, uh, mm -hmm. research the tiny revolvers that um, Kasul uh, started, and mm -hmm. now American Arms. Uh, I've had a chance to just, you know, in that vein, just being interested in those mini revolvers. I've toured the North American Arms factory. I've met people that uh, cast the frames for those revolvers. I've 
uh, met people along the way that you know were involved. Jerry, uh, I've interviewed uh, Sandy, and you know it's stuff that's it's just neat to uh, to to discover this and then to share it and then to discover that there's tons of people out there that are interested in the same thing. So if you're yeah. frustrated and you figure, oh, I don't have the resources or I don't have the knowledge, uh, participate. There's so many ways you can participate uh, and add to this. Uh, set of knowledge. You know, as we go forward, the everything we put on the internet today is recorded, sometimes multiple times in a day. So yep. anything you contribute, you add to the internet, will be there forever. Uh, it'll help future researchers. Uh, and as new researchers get familiar with the internet or with the means of communication, uh, you're there to for them to discover and uh, hit cook up with and and again grow our uh, collective knowledge. So. Um, I just wanted to put a little plug out there to get people who are motivated to uh, uh, give them a little spark to kind of to kind of play host and uh, pivot a little bit, give you a, a bit of a, a change for a question to kind of end it here. We've gotten uh, fewer questions coming in. Another one from David, though, on the gun channel side, we'll wrap it up with is uh, if you had to pick just one style, AK or AR. Oh, God. <sighs> The classic question. Well, one of the classic questions. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, I guess if I had to pick one, uh, I would have to say AK. Uh, and you know, and and we could spend an entire hour just debating that. But um, but I I think uh, if I had to pick one, I I would say AK. Now, just a side question, did you ever have an opportunity to meet either Kalashnikov or Stoner? No, I did not. Um, I didn't have a chance to meet either one of them. I have friends who met Kalashnikov uh, in the early 90s. He came over here to Virginia. The Virginia Gun Collectors actually uh, sponsored his trip to get him to come over here. Um, uh, so I, I know some folks that have some amazing stories about what it was like uh, for him to to come and see uh, capitalism, uh, taking him to to a mall, <laughs> which just literally blew his mind. Um, but and how uh, many people were uh, fans of his and his machine? And, and right, he didn't yeah, I understand. He was just amazed that it was such a phenomenon. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think one of the coolest historic photos that I've I've ever seen is it's a picture of Stoner and Kalashnikov the first time they met and they're standing there and Stoner's holding an AK and Kalashnikov is holding an AR. Uh, and I, I thought that was just a, a really neat melding of the minds to have two of the greatest 20th century arms developers holding each other's firearm. It's pretty cool. Super awesome. And it's such a representation of the like peaceful culmination of the Cold War. You know, like, yeah, right definitely. Definitely. And, and the small arms that literally changed the world and the guys that get it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. You are dead on. So now let's give credit where credit is due. You mentioned the Virginia Collectors uh, Club or whatever, what, the Collectors Association that made that happen. And you mentioned earlier about uh, your role with the NRA working with the Collectors Associations. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps in future shows, we can uh, delve into some of those. I have just barely know a few people in the Dallas Collectors Association, but the Again, the, the the value and the the content that they bring to our community is amazing, and uh, yeah. often overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the collectors are are a key to a lot of stuff. You know, like I said, there's there's stuff that's in private collections that isn't in museums, um, because oftentimes the collectors have the financial ability to put those. Uh, put those items in their collections and museums just don't have the budget for it. Um, and plus collectors are generally speaking, some of the friendliest, nicest people you will ever meet, regardless of what they collect, you know, because people collect things because they like them and they want to, to talk about them with other people who like what they like. And it certainly shows through in the gun world. Uh, I have, I have never approached a collector uh, that is exhibiting some of their stuff and said, hey, can you talk to me about, you know, X, Y, or Z? And them look at me and go, no, I don't have time. They always, the eyes light up and, you know, and, and they are on a roll. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely don't, don't discount the collectors anywhere in the country uh, because they are a treasure trove of knowledge. And I guarantee you they are more than willing 
uh, to, to talk about their collection with you. And again, the, you, you have, I'm going to quote your website here. You say the ease in which you can recall obscure historical facts and figures makes you good at Jeopardy, but bad at geometry. But that's, again, the, the kind of conversations that you can have with people are going to give you like, maybe, for example, like the Rugers made the, the hand tools before. Mm -hmm. they, they, that kind of stuff is it, just so neat. And, and, and I think by sharing that, I hope by sharing that, we help the society in general know that firearms are not just some violent, you know, need for whatever they like to suggest, but instead just uh, such a big part of our culture and so intertwined with everything we're doing. And and uh, and, and again, that kind of just insight that people share like that can, I think, add to that. Absolutely, without a doubt. So again, I appreciate you coming on with us for a bit over an hour here. And uh, let's wrap up with uh, how people can contact you, what kind of, uh, actually, I have one more question for you before we uh, let you wrap up with all the, okay. the tidying up with uh, how to contact you and how to support you and uh, what you've got next. Uh, we had a question come in on an interview the other day, and uh, I liked it, so I'm going to ask that again. I think it was actually from David on the Gun Channel side, but he didn't ask it today. Where do you see what you're doing? How do you see your projects in five years? Where are you headed? Hmm, that's a good question. Where am I headed? Uh, hopefully onward and upward. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to, to be able to do a little bit more traveling uh, and, and a little bit more lecturing. Uh, I've done a few this year already. I got a few more coming up later in this uh, in the year. You and I talked about that before we went on air. Um, so I'd like to be able to do a little bit more of that. Uh, I've got uh, a, a couple different manuscripts in the works that I'd, I'd like to, to try to get published. Um, and uh, just continue doing what I'm doing um, because I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do it. So I, I see myself in five years doing the same thing I am now, um, just a little bit wiser and hopefully a little bit wealthier. <laughs> right on. And you're, you're well, I, I hope I wish you the best success. You're at a good time in the history of tech and interests and, and you know, everything. So, you know, there's, there's, you're, you're starting with a fresh project of, at a good time. Yep, and exactly. Very fairly fluent. We've got uh, the presence on the platforms, and how would people get a hold of you if they? Yeah, so uh, the easiest way to to find me with everything uh, is just to go to highcaliberhistory.com, uh, and that will give you links to to work that I've published all over the internet and in print. It'll give you access to my uh, my blog. Uh, also give you access to links for my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Of course, I've, I've got a, a small YouTube channel uh, as well. Um, and that's also got my email address and my phone number on there. If, if I can if I can help anyone in, in any way, if you know of, of someone that's looking for a, a lecture or looking for help with research on a piece, if you've hit a dead end, um, you know, trying to identify granddad's old gun or, or anything like that, uh, certainly hit me up, you know, at, at highcaliberhistory.com. You can, you can find all the ways to get a hold of me and I will do my best to help in any way that I can. Awesome. And I imagine if someone's maybe in a, on a board or uh, in an organization that has guest lecturers for maybe a town or an area or region, um, you might check with Logan if he's going to be around. I bet you he could uh, be available to talk about firearms in that area or area of yeah. history. Here. Absolutely. Always looking for new opportunities to, to talk with folks in different avenues. So, yes, please, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, my dad always used to say there's, there's no such thing as a dumb question, but there are dumb people who ask questions. Uh, but I always <laughs> caveat that with, but he's, he's never met the folks that I hang out with in the gun community. Uh, they're all good folks. So, but seriously, if, if anyone has a question about anything, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Please reach out to me. I'm, I'm here to help. It's all about the dissemination of the knowledge. Appreciate it. And I can uh, offer firsthand experience that I reached out to Logan with the, uh, Firearms Inventors cards, and you helped make them a better product. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I was happy to do it. Um, oh, I was going to ask, is there any way people can support you? Do you have any fundraising projects that we can help facilitate what you're doing? Buy you a cup of coffee. You know, I, I don't at this time. I, I really need to, to set up a, a Patreon or something like that. 
Um, so at, at this point in time, no, there, there's really no way. Uh, if you really, really feel inclined to send me five bucks, get a hold of me and I'll give you my PayPal address. But, <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, at this point, the, the, the best way you can, you can support me is, is following me on the different social media channels and, and sharing out the content, because as we all know, it's getting harder and harder with the algorithms to, to be able to see the content specifically the firearms related content. So for now, follow me, share the stuff. That's a tremendous help. It certainly is. And it's a great exercise for everybody to, to be aware that we use the internet. We don't watch television. We're not reading newspapers. We're interactive with this stuff. And uh, it's not all about finances. Um, uh, Logan has an awesome uh, Instagram channel. And uh, by sharing those photos and putting them in your, uh, what's that called, story, and you know, putting mm -hmm. that little thing at the top uh, that gets that spreads the word and you've got always interesting posts and uh, when you're visiting places this one I thought was interesting uh, when uh, Notre Dame was on fire you posted this picture from the World War II I guess and yes. uh, the amount of sandbags is staggering I mean it it makes sense such an important piece of uh, history and everything to you know put this amount of effort but the tremendous effort that was put in there uh, to keep yeah. it safe Amazing. Yeah, yeah, they sandbagged the whole thing and still used it. That photo, there, there's actually a choir in there singing. So, <laughs> <laughs> very cool. So again, thanks for for being on today, and uh, looking forward uh, to talking with you in the future. We're going to chat a bit about um, museums in the future. Uh, we'll probably chat if we can. Uh, keep some of your time to chat about uh, the libraries. Uh, we can yep. chat about uh, some gun books. And if other people have uh, things that you'd like to hear Logan talk about, contact them, contact me. And uh, thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Pete. And thanks to, to all the people out there watching that ask questions. Really appreciate it. We'll end with our friend Charles here in Tucson. The guys and gals of gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching gunwebsites.com.